Um, this is um, an event arranged by the LGBT Heritage Project in um, collaboration with the Health and Wellbeing Fair. And um, the LGBT Heritage Project is a two-year project funded by the Heritage Fund, um, led by Here and I in partnership with the Rainbow Project Car Friend. And we are looking at um, LGBT archives, uh, arranging to interview some older LGBT and particularly focus on the 80s and 90s. But one of the things that's um, come up um, is an awareness that LGBT heritage might actually be good for our health and well being. And uh, one of our volunteers, Michael Fire, um, has taken a big interest in this and is um, going to tell us today about um, ways in which we might come to understand how a greater understanding of our LGBT history and heritage might be good for our health and well-being. So I'm delighted that, that uh, Michael has um, done some preparation uh, uh, for this and looking forward very much to what he might be sharing with us. Thank you very much, Michael. Okay, thank you, Richard. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see my presentation. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to be with you. Um, you've all got your screens um, blank now, so I can't see you. So I've done a few of these webinars just over lockdown, not on this topic, but um, they talk about uh, speaking into the void. So I'm going to speak into the void now for the next um hopefully next half hour or so. Um, we'll see how we go. And um, as Richard was saying, this is something that uh, I, I've quite a bit of interest in. I work in the um, heritage and museum sector and um, I'll talk a little bit about that during the course of this presentation. But um, as part of my work, I've done a, a certain amount of work um, looking at the benefits of uh, heritage uh, and in my particular context, museums for people's well-being. So I'm delighted uh, you can be with us this afternoon. And um, as I say, we're going to be uh, looking at this particular topic as part of the LGBT uh, uh, Health and Wellbeing Fair. Um, and as Leo was saying, please, if there are um, questions or thoughts that come to you during the course of this presentation, put them in the chat and we can um, talk about them uh, afterwards. Um, hopefully there will be a good amount of time for discussion if you want to do that. Um, I am by no means an expert on this topic. It is a huge topic, um, even just well-being or heritage or the connections between well-being and heritage, never mind well-being and LGBT heritage. But as I say, hopefully you'll find this interesting and engaging and uh, there'll be a lot to think about as well. Um, so, just to start off with um, some personal thoughts about um, the connections between well-being and LGBT heritage. Um, many of you will no doubt know the name Roger Casement, who um, is probably the most famous gay Irishman uh, aside from Oscar Wilde. Um, he was a diplomat, he was a humanitarian, a human rights campaigner, he uh, investigated atrocities in the rubber trade in the Belgian Congo in the early 20th century and also in, um, in Peru. He was knighted for that work. Um, also an Irish nationalist, was involved in the Easter Rising um, and was arrested in 1916 and put on trial for treason and executed and was actually, it was the anniversary of his execution last Monday, the 3rd of August. Um, but you might also know that Casement, um, as, I, as I mentioned, was, was famously, he, he, was, uh, he was gay. Um, just after his arrest, they find the authorities find diaries, uh, the so-called black diaries, journals that he kept, which um, set out uh, some of the um, relationships uh, that he'd had with other gay men. Um, uh, he was very sexually active. Um, and and yet lived as a closeted gay man, and I've uh, I've actually got a copy of this book, um, Roger Casement, um, The Black Diaries, written by Jeff Dudgeon, who many of you will know as an LGBT uh, campaigner and formerly an Ulster Unionist councillor in Belfast City Council. Um, the reason I mentioned Casement is because 
I grew up in North Belfast and uh, went to school um, at BRA on the Cliftonville Road. And growing up in North Belfast as a as a young gay man, um, I didn't really. Uh, I always had an interest in history, but I wasn't really aware of any sort of local gay figures. And then I came across this book, uh, Jeff Dudgeon's book about uh, casement, a figure I, I didn't really know much about. Uh, I was probably in my 20s at the time. And just reading about casement, um, who when he stayed in Belfast, actually stayed at 105 Antrim Road, so stayed in North Belfast where I grew up. He actually, where he stayed, was just a couple of streets away from where my great-great-grandparents were living. In uh, they're, they're there in the 1911 census. And, um, and, and just the kind of... the the personal connection I was able to make with a figure like Roger Casement, who's still a, a very controversial figure in, in some ways. There are still historians who don't accept the authenticity of the Black Diaries. And um, uh, without wanting to make any moral comment on his sex life, um, there's, there's no doubt the fact that he's still an important figure in LGBT history. He also, as you can see in the photograph, he had a great beard. Uh, I'm a fan of Roger Casement's beard. I'm not ashamed to say that. But I think for me, as I say, growing up as a young gay man, um, just being able to connect with a figure like Roger Casement um, and um, still something I'm really fascinated by, um, I find that was actually really good for my well-being as a gay man. And I find um, just being able to make that connection with local gay history um, was um, something that I think was, yeah, it was really, was really positive for my, my well-being as a, as a gay man in uh, the early 2000s. Um, so let's talk a bit about um, well-being, first of all. Well-being is one of those kind of very general, vague terms that we maybe throw around and we don't actually know what it, what it means. And there are all kinds of different definitions about what does well-being actually mean. And the New Economics Foundation, which is a, a think tank that promotes economic and, and social justice, um, it has a pretty succinct definition of well-being, which is the concept of well-being comprises two main elements, feeling good and functioning well. It's as simple as that. So feeling good are emotions such as happiness, contentment, enjoyment, um, curiosity and engagement. Functioning well, um, if we're functioning well, we're experiencing positive relationships, we're having some control of our lives, and we're having a sense of purpose as well. Um, as I say, there are lots of different definitions of well-being, but that's generally what it means. And it is quite an holistic term. Um, it it in includes lots of different things, but that's generally what it means. Um, the five ways to well-being, I'll be talking quite a bit about this um, during this session. Um, I came across these a few years ago and I'll talk again a little bit later about how I first came across these in my work for uh, the museum I work for. Um, but these again were come up by the New Economics Foundation in about 2008. They came out of um, research that they did um, alongside the government looking at ways in which people can actually enhance their well-being and they really stood the test of time. Um, they are used by all kinds of um, health groups, all kinds of health organizations, um, schools, um, right across different sectors um, and they're a pretty good uh, general way of being able to improve well-being and they are connect so connect with the people around you um, connect with your individually with people with your neighbors with your family at work in your local community um, your relationships with other people be active you know leo was just talking about yoga there that's a really good way to stay active, go for a walk or a run, just discover some kind of way of getting your body moving and uh, encouraging your own uh, physical activity. Um, take notice, so be aware of your surroundings, be aware of the world that's around you and, and how you're feeling within yourself as well. Keep learning, um, keep discovering new skills, rediscover old interests, sign up for a course, have a goal to work towards, something that you can achieve. Um, I did Couch to 5K a couple of weeks ago. I'm very proud of that. And uh, give. So do something nice for a friend or a stranger. Thank someone, volunteer, join a community group. So those um, taken as a whole are five pretty good ways to enhance your well-being. And as I say, um, I'll talk a little bit later about the connections between heritage and LGBT heritage and the five ways to well-being. Um, I couldn't 
uh, host a, a seminar or a webinar like this without talking about LGBT well-being in NI. Um, here in Northern Ireland, I guess uh, many of us are aware of the particular challenges that LGBT people face um, in terms of their own um, well-being. I looked at a couple of reports. Um, Leo might be able to tell me if there's anything more recent than these, but this is what I find uh, through online research. So one is um, a report by Malachi O'Hara for the Rainbow Re uh, Project back in 2013. And it won't surprise many of you to know that it found that there is a higher instance of poor emotional health and well-being amongst LGBT people compared with the wider population. And a lot of that has to do with inequalities. It has to do with homophobia, prejudice, um, and uh, I, I, I guess a greater need for awareness uh, of um, LGBT needs, um, to, to put it quite generally. Um, another report which I came across, which I think is quite interesting in uh, the context that we're talking about today, is um, looking at guidelines to support the needs of older LGBT people. So this was a public health agency report um, written in cooperation with Rainbow and other organizations. And it found that, uh, just to take a couple of examples, four out of five respondents believed healthcare professionals needed more awareness of LGBT needs, and one in four did not know someone who could or would, share, or would care for them if they required it, which is a really sad statistic. Um, I think sometimes we forget about the particular needs of older LGBT people. And I find certainly in my work in heritage that um, there's so much engagement um, in the heritage and museum sector with older people. But sometimes um, I think, yeah, I think particularly LGBT older people maybe get forgotten about. Um, so there are definitely um, huge challenges across all kinds of age groups and uh, across the, the whole spectrum of the LGBT plus uh, community. Um, I also came across um, this uh, news article this week. Obviously we've been through lockdown over the past few months and all of us, um, whether we're LGBT or not, have um, found it really challenging in terms of our own health and well-being. But this was The Guardian um, on the 5th of August on Wednesday, talking about um, a new report that's just come out called, um, it's called the Quarantine uh, Survey. And this was looking at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the LGBT community. And again, it probably won't surprise you that given that um, there are so many health inequalities uh, that LGBT people have to face. Um, these have been exacerbated in many ways by lockdown. So 69% of respondents uh, responded talking about suffering from depression, it rose to 90% of those experiencing um, homophobia, transphobia. One in six respondents said that they'd experienced discrimination. A lot of people um, being confined to their own homes, maybe with family or friends who um, are not supportive of their sexuality or their gender identity, um, about 10, well, almost 10% of people felt unsafe in their own homes. And there, there have been higher levels of stress and depressive symptoms for transgender and, and gender diverse respondents to that survey. So now more than ever, it's so important for us to be focusing on um, the, uh, the, the need to promote well-being amongst the LGBT community. And hopefully during the rest of this presentation, we'll see just, um, uh, the, the, the potential um, to improve well-being uh, through LGBT heritage. Um, I mentioned that I work in the heritage museum sector. sector. I, I am actually the outreach officer for a museum called the Northern Ireland War Memorial, which is a second world war museum in the cathedral quarter in Talbot Street, just beside St Anne's Cathedral in Belfast. And when I first came across, um, I first really came across well-being work um, as a museum professional through something called the Live Well Project and this was um, this was last year and this was um, a project that was run by uh, national museums in Northern Ireland so the Ulster Museum, the Folk Museum, the Transport Museum and uh, the Ulster American Folk Park and uh, this was a project aiming to connect disadvantaged older people um, with museum collections and it was actually based on the five ways to well-being that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. And the whole idea was that um, museum professionals like myself would be able to go out to community groups, to older people's homes, 
um, particularly in disadvantaged areas uh, where there might be areas particularly of social inequality and um, use the five ways to well-being to bring museum collections to these people and allow them to connect with museums and they, they would also visit the museum as well. So I just included um, a couple of photographs from a craft project that I was involved with. Um, we decorated uh, notebooks with uh, poppy, uh, poppy napkins. The poppy is the symbol of my uh, museum, symbol of remembrance, and also with copies of a map that the Luftwaffe uh, used to bomb Belfast during the Belfast Blitz in 1941. And just on the left, you can actually see one participant has decorated her notebook, and she actually has inscribed it with um, the name of an air raid. Uh, warden uh, who was killed during the Belfast Blitz in 1941. I, we have a list of all the people who were killed in the, the Belfast Blitz and I was able to bring it out to the script and she was able to find the name of this man. This man is actually her uncle. Um, he was only 22 year, two years old when he was killed in 1941 and um, this lady was really moved to be able to find his name, to be able to find that family connection in uh, the details that I brought out um, along with objects from the museum and so she created this notebook and she she decorated it and she she put this inscription in it to remember him and I think that was just one way of um, being able to 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 see the power of um, using heritage to promote well well-being uh, amongst a, a group like that and um, and in this particular uh, case the emotional connection that can be formed um, through uh, heritage, how that can really impact on somebody's emotional well-being. Um, and my museum as well, we, as I say, we do a lot of work, particularly with older people because we're a Second World War museum. On the left you can see a reminiscence box, um, a loan box that we bring out to community groups and older people's homes filled with objects from the Second World War. Um, and on the right you can see um, a singing workshop that we host in the museum. We do a lot of these singing and reminiscence workshops, um, particularly for older people living with dementia. It has been demonstrated that singing for the brain uh, improves um, people who are living with well-being, their, their uh, cognitive reserve, their cognitive capacity. Um, and again, that's been a way in which we've been able to make those connections between heritage and well-being in our own particular context. Um, and I just want to include this briefing paper from last year. There's so much research that's being, um, that's being uh, included uh, and that's being um, undertaken into the connection between heritage and well-being. Um, and these are just some examples of what heritage activities look like what heritage actually looks like. Cultural activities in museums, um, heritage object handling in hospitals, healthcare settings, where I talked about bringing objects out to say, for example, older people's homes for uh, reminiscence activities. Visiting museums, historic houses, and other heritage sites, which is obviously a huge uh, part of heritage for most people. Um, Heritage-based social engagement and inclusion projects, um, which I, I, I'd, I'd say is again, um, increasingly becoming a huge part of, uh, of heritage, heritage at the minute, heritage volunteering and community heritage research. And there are so many benefits um, to, this, uh, to this work and to these activities. Increased confidence, sense of empowerment, social connectivity, life satisfaction and happiness, skills and learning, sense of pride and sense of belonging. Those are just a few. So there's definitely um, research and evidence that shows that there are benefits um, to being involved in heritage activities. Excuse me. So I'm just going to talk briefly about some examples of really good heritage um, activities, LGBT, particularly heritage uh, that's taking, um, that's been taking place over the past few years. Um, this is a really significant example um, because um, this is Prejudice and Pride which was um, run by the National Trust in 2017. 2017 was the 50th anniversary of the decriminalization of, uh, or the partial decriminalization of um, same-sex uh, relationships between men, same-sex acts between men. So the National Trust put in a, a really uh, impressive program of events and activities and interpretation 
at um, various different properties. They also attended Pride. So the photograph you can see here is Birmingham Pride in 2017. Um, and uh, it was a really huge program. It had a really huge impact. You can see in the top uh, right there as well, they produced this fantastic book on um, the, uh, the project with the photograph there of the Marquis of Anglesey, looking really dressed down, as you can see in his costume there. Um, but uh, one particular um, aspect of this Prejudice and Pride uh, series was um, uh, what the National Trust did one, at one of their properties called Kingston Lacey, which is a mansion house in Dorset. And what you can see in this photograph is um, an art installation called Ex Exile. And this was based around the fact that one of the previous owners of Kingston Lacey was a man called William John Banks, who was an aristocrat. He was a, a collector of artworks and antiquities. Um, he was an MP, very well connected man. And he was, um, he was actually caught in flagrante, as they say, with a, uh, a soldier in a park in London in the 1830s and he had to flee abroad effectively to save his life and what you see in this photograph is in, in this art installation it's called In, in Memoriam uh, In Memoriam and uh, it's a tribute to the 51 men who were hanged under laws that criminalized same-sex acts during Banks's lifetime. He never actually returned to England um, but during the course of his lifetime that's the number of men that they find in records who were actually hanged and I think supposedly the um, the length of the uh, ropes actually corresponds to the ages of um, the men who were executed. I think the youngest was maybe a teenager and the oldest was in his 70s um, so really a brutal reminder of what um, particularly in this case uh, um, gay men had to go through uh, during that period and there were also as part of this art installation exile there were also um, displays relating to contemporary LGBT rights um, and how the law has changed and yet how in so many other parts of the world um, outside of the UK um, there are still so many inequalities and injustices faced by LGBT uh, people. And there were so many benefits, not just to this particular aspect of Prejudice and Pride, but also um, all the other events that took place. Um, there was a visitor engagement report, which was undertaken by Leicester University's um, Research Council for a research centre for museums and um, galleries. And they found that there, was, there were benefits in terms of the value of representation, hidden history, support for human rights, recognition of diversity and support for LGBT uh, community in the current political climate. It was overwhelmingly positive. 72% of visitors to National Trust properties taking part in Prejudice, uh, Prejudice and Pride um, responded positively. Um, some people said that um, LGBT, LGBT people have always been here. Everyone's different and we need to accept that. Um, this exhibition is needed now more than ever. And I think it's important for the National Trust to represent the whole nation in its differences. Um, and a lot of LGBT people particularly felt that this was something that really made them feel welcome for the first time in a National Trust property. Um, so that was a really good example of a recent LGBT heritage project. A little bit more local, the Plymouth LGBT archive. This was um, a few years ago actually um, and uh, this took uh, place back in 2012. I'm just looking at my notes here. Yeah, 2012 and um, this was an archive that was set up with heritage lottery funding, um, the same funding that goes into the LGBT Heritage NI uh, project, um, looking to collect um, oral histories and to create a material culture archive of LGBT history in uh, Plymouth. It actually won the most inspirational archive award at the Community Archives and Heritage Group Awards back in 2012. And I think one of the benefits to this um, was that it, um, it allowed so many um, LGBT people to um, overcome maybe a sense of shame that they maybe once felt, particularly um, during a period, during the period of criminalization and being able, particularly older LGBT people to tell their stories, to uh, be recorded. Um, it allowed them um, to have a sense of pride in their own stories and to take ownership of their own stories and their own identities. And um, 
and, and that allowed for a different future compared maybe to what they'd experienced in the past. And Heritage Lottery have been great actually in recent years um, with the amount of money they've been able to put into community uh, funded um, heritage projects, particularly looking at LGBT um, heritage and LGBT uh, stories. Um, another great project is the Museum of Transology. Again, this is a bit of a smaller project compared to say, for example, the National Trust. Um, the man you can see on the left is E.J. Scott, and he is a, um, a transgender man. He's a fashion historian, he's an LGBT um, rights campaigner, and he got the idea for the Museum of Transology from um, his own transition when he kept all the medical related objects from his, his transition. He started collecting in 2014, and in 2017, the Museum of Transology went on display for the first time at the London College of Fashion. And really, it's, um, it's a mobile museum that collects and exhibits artifacts, material, culture relating to uh, trans, non-binary, and intersex people's everyday experiences. So on the right, you can see a photograph um, of an object from the collection, and it's um, a lipstick that was given to uh, an LGBT or uh, a transgender uh, woman by her sister. Uh, she was the first family member to accept and support uh, her transition. Um, and uh, I think the advantage of this is that there's so many everyday objects uh, like this lipstick. EJ Scott talks about um, the real benefit of being able um, to keep tags with these objects because um, so often what might happen in a museum or a heritage site is that an object's donated and then a curator makes a decision about what the interpretation should be of this object if it goes on display whereas that's um, that's actually impossible in this case because the tag is attached to the object so the story stays with the object so the the the, the person who's donated the object the story um, stays in the interpretation. Um, and E.J. Scott says this, what's extraordinary about these everyday objects is the way in which they share themes of not only despair, but of hope, of ambition, achievement, self-confidence and success, real voices, real things, real people. They are emotionally charged, personal and heartwarming. And this is a way particularly um, for transgender people of, um, I guess challenging the invisibility that they so often have to face when they visit museums or heritage sites um, and it's a way of empowering them to tell their own stories. Um, this went on display for three years in Brighton at the Museum and Art Gallery there and I think it um, it's now in storage and the hope is that it will travel in the future and it currently has over 280 objects and no object is rejected from the collection. Uh, if you send in an object as a transgender non-binary intersex person with that tag then it will be accepted for the collection and again it's a way of empowering those people to tell their their stories in a heritage uh, museum context. Uh, the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin, Rainbow Revolution, which was an exhibition um, which went on display for the first time last year. Obviously there have been so many changes in LGBT rights in the Republic over the past few years, particularly with the marriage referendum in 2015. Um, and this is, um, this exhibition went on display at the Collins Barracks site of the National Museum of Ireland. Um, and so they have objects, as you can see in the poster on the left, relating, for example, to Panty Bliss, a drag queen, um, LGBT rights campaigner, made a very famous speech at the Abbey Theatre, um, uh, campaigning for the marriage referendum in 2014. And you can actually see her dress, it's the purple there on the right. You can also see two um, wedding dresses that were worn by Minister for Children and Youth Affairs, Catherine Zapponi and her wife, Anne Louise Gilligan. And those were worn at their wedding ceremony in Dublin Castle in 2016, um, which was obviously the site of the celebrations for the legalization of same-sex marriage by the popular vote. And very poignantly, um, uh, Anne Louise Gilligan died actually the year after her marriage. Um, and they're also collecting oral histories um, relating to LGBT people and there's a, actually a new Rainbow Revolution trail is now available to the public to walk around the museum as well, which is fantastic. And then in our own Northern Ireland context, there have been so many, um, so many examples of uh, 
uh, LGBT exhibitions in recent years, particularly at the Ulster Museum. So you can see on the right, uh, Gay Life and Liberation, which was a photographic e exhibition um, on 1970s Belfast. And that was actually um, collected from photographs which belonged to uh, Douglas Sobey, who helped find Car Friend in 1974 and has remained and remained an officer there for 30 years. Um, really interesting insight into gay life in the 1970s. The Ulster Museum's uh, The Troubles and Beyond exhibition, which was revamped just a couple of years ago, I think it was 2018, um, now does include a lot of LGBT objects, which wasn't the case before, which is great to see LGBT heritage represented as part of mainstream culture, as part of what was going on during the period of the Troubles. Also in the centre there, you'll see that there was an exhibition which was launched actually back in February at the Museum of Free Dairy in Derry called um, Queering uh, the North. Um, and this was the first time that an, a large scale exhibition had taken place in the museum. Um, also in partnership with the Festival of LGBT History, looking at the development of LGBT rights in Northern Ireland. And I, I'm assuming it's still there um, in, in the museum. I'm not sure if they've reopened yet, but I'm assuming it's still on, on display there. So there's been so much that's been taking place, um, real explosion in recent years of LGBT heritage in museums and heritage sites um, from the national, like national organisations, like the National Trust or National Museums, down to the, the local and the community, um, like uh, the Plymouth LGBT archive. And it's fantastic to see. It's been so empowering, I think, for LGBT people. And I think it's had a real impact on um, the LGBT community's well-being. There's still a lot of research taking place, I think, into um, the impact, the connections between well-being and LGBT heritage. But um, I have no doubt that the way in which so many of these projects have been promoting um, the qualities of empathy and understanding and also celebrating equality and diversity. Those have been really, um, really positive and really beneficial for LGBT well-being. Oh, and also the talk, just to mention as well, um, LGBT tours of Hillsborough Castle. Chris Reed, who's a PhD researcher at Ulster University, very kindly sent me a couple of these images and he's been instrumental in starting these LGBT tours at Hillsborough Castle. You might know that Hillsborough Castle um, opened to the public a couple of years ago. Um, they're run by historic royal palaces who run um, Hampton Court Palace and uh, Kensington Palace and the Tower of London. This was the first property outside of London and they've been able to do LGBT tours um, in Hillsborough Castle and again that's been really significant because of obviously Hillsborough Castle is the seat of the monarchy in Northern Ireland and again it's just been fantastic to see um, LGBT heritage represented at that level in Northern Ireland. Um, so just to talk, just as we're coming to the end of this presentation, just to talk about um, our own project, the LGBT Heritage Project, Northern Ireland. It's incredible to think that it's only been, um, it, it, this, this project was launched in February, so it's actually been six months. You can see a photograph there of the launch taking place in the Ulster Museum. Um, but it's incredible to think just of what's been happening in terms of events and activities with the project over the past few months. Obviously the project was launched in February, just a few weeks before the lockdown. And so we have been restricted, I suppose, in, in terms of how much we want to do. And I have to give credit to Richard, who's just been fantastic, has shown so much energy and drive in being able to put on activities. Um, these are just a selection of some of the events that have taken place and some of the activities that have taken place. But Richard, of course, is also you'll know he's a great storyteller and he's been able to contribute to so many other LGBT um, events just outside of the project um, over the past few months. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's just been a great opportunity for so many of us um, to be able to attend these events and then to be involved like myself as a volunteer as well. And here you can see some of our lovely volunteers. Um, and I asked some of our volunteers just to give some feedback about how the project has actually been impacting on their well-being. As Richard said, this is a heritage um, lottery funded project. And one of the outcomes is looking at um, the, the positives for our well-being. And um, 
the volunteers very kindly talked about how so much of the project has helped them keep connected to a network, particularly during this period of isolation. It's kept them motivated. It's given them a purpose. Um, it's created new connections and um, allowed uh, them to connect with the wider LGBT community. Um, and I think that sense of connection has been really beneficial for, for us as volunteers and um, particularly during the period of the lockdown. And um, they also very kindly filled in the survey for me. So you can see that 89% of volunteers uh, agreed that the project had helped them take notice. These are based on five ways to well-being. Um, it helped them connect, it helped them keep learning, it helped them give. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do much um, physically. Um, so we haven't been able even to meet with each other physically really at the moment. So it's been difficult to keep active as part of uh, the well-being for this project. But I've no doubt that um, we'll be able to build more of that into the project as it continues. Um, there's been overwhelming agreement as well, um, I think. Um, so Richard tells me from members of the public after attending project, event, project events that they felt uplifted. And this is one particular piece of feedback from a member of the public on LGBT History Club, which is now going to be a monthly event run in partnership with the, uh, the Linen Hall uh, library in conjunction with um, the project. I find it incredibly affirming that sexual history and queerness does not just start at Stonewall. I know that sounds odd but it makes me feel a lot more at peace with myself. So people are really connecting with LGBT heritage through the project which is fantastic. Um, just as I finish I thought I'd maybe come up with some top tips for how we could connect well-being with LGBT heritage. Um, and these are, as I've mentioned, based on the five ways to well-being. So connect, connect with the LGBT community around our heritage. I think there's definitely a place for talking with older LGBT people about their memories. Um, we hope as part of the project to eventually interview older LGBT people. The remit of the project is looking at the period between 1982 and 1998. And there are so many people around who will be able to contribute their memories and their stories of that time. And we're really looking forward to that. Um, and I think also there's a, a, a place for strengthening existing relationships with family and friends. I mentioned the National Trust, Prejudice and Pride, how many even non-LGBT people, family members, friends, allies, um, felt empathy from what they experienced through that. Um, be active, go on a walking tour. There are lots of L good LGBT heritage walking tours. And I think actually a couple took place during Pride recently. Go for a walk listening to an LGBT history pro podcast. Uh, take notice, find a visit a museum with exhibits displaying LGBT heritage, look for LGBT connections with local history, um, keep learning, read books, attend LGBT heritage events like this one, do research, keep being curious and give. Um, we're very keen to collect artifacts, stories, um, anything connected, any, anything that you have connected with LGBT heritage. Um, you might also want to volunteer your time with community groups or organisations to promote this heritage. That is a whistle-stop tour through LGBT um, heritage and well-being. Um, I'm going to finish my presentation there, but I've given Richard's email address and we're on um, social media. And thank you very much for your attention. Um,